to pay attention to me. <laughs> All right, Wait, are we going in? Welcome. Uh, okay, what do we do? So let me just start out by saying that we're gonna start now by asking you to please put your, your cameras away so there'll be no photography and no video tonight. Please, I'm asking you, we'll stop right now. So please put your phones away. This is a very special um, event and the, we're having a very reach moment because there is no backstage. You just saw it, that's why I said <laughs> keep talking. And we designed this space to do that. Um, I want to start by saying that um, when we were designing the festival, we very much wanted to have a series of conversations. And one of the people that we love so much in our community is Justice Sotomayor. <laughs> benefits of my uh, position. Oh, by the way, my name is Deborah Rutter. I work here. <laughs> okay, so. And um, one of the great benefits of my job is that I get to meet and talk to these extraordinary individuals who live and work here in Washington. And we've had a couple of really interesting conversations and musical and dramatic and, and dance and theater, and she's a big supporter of the arts um, and a big supporter of the Kennedy Center and comes here as often as she has opportunity. So I called her chambers and said, we would love if you would come and be a part of our festival and talk about access and the importance of the arts. And um, we had a summer of conversation about it. And what was really amazing, at the end of the conversation, she said, I'd love to be a part of it. And here's who I'd like to do it with. And so she chose Rose Dilly Cyprian. <laughs> My understanding is that this is going to be a conversation and not a debate, but we <laughs> clearly have two masters of debate. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to the two of them, but I'd like to recognize Heidi Schreck. Uh, Heidi is here. And, um, I guess I don't really need to say why you're here. <laughs> but you do have a show soon, and so does Rosalie, so we won't be here all evening. Um, so without any further ado, thank you so much, and let's hear what they have to say. <laughs> you. Well, I don't think this audience knows how much we have in common. <laughs> Neither We're, do I. Well. <laughs> It's a lot. We are both from New York City. Yes. All right. We have, second, we love the Yankees together. Yes. Third, we both have been raised by incredible mothers. Please introduce your mom. Uh, that's my, no my mom. <laughs> Fourth, we both have been debaters in middle school. Oh, wow. Me too. Fourth, we have both been involved in community activities. Yes. And we both love it, don't we? Yes. All right. So why don't you tell the audience, because I don't know how many of them know mm -hmm. about your play. Yeah. Because I'm a judge, you're an actress, I think they know what I do. But I'm not sure they fully know what you do. So tell them what play you're in and what it's about and how it intersects with the community. Okay, so the play that I am in, and we're doing it right now at the Kennedy Center at the Eisenhower Theater, it's called What the Constitution Means to Me, written and direct, written by Heidi Schreck and directed by Oliver Butler. And so I like 
like to think of the play as kind of a woman, one woman show, but not really, because then I'm in it and another actor is in it. So, <laughs> so Heidi tells you about your life, her life stories, and her generate and her generations and her family before her. But she does it in a form of a debate because she debated in Wenatchee when she was 15. She won prize money for college, and she tells you all about her story. She connects it to the 14th Amendment and so much more. It's like it pulls at your heartstrings, you know. <laughs> and she uses uh, a wild metaphors. Um, she, I think, she calls the the Constitution a crucible, or the Ninth Amendment a crucible. Um, it's a very interesting metaphor. And then we have another actor named Mike Iveson. He comes and he tells us a personal account of his life. He plays the Legionnaire, and then. Heidi talks more about her story, and then I come in. I introduce myself. Hi, my name is Roselli. I'm 15 years old from New York City, and um, I debate. So I think in this play, I'm an actress and a debater because I debate on stage with Heidi about should we abolish the United States Constitution? <laughs> and on some nights, uh, I choose proposition to abolish. Some nights, I use opposition to keep. We can switch it up, change it. And so we basically debate about that. And uh, then at the end, we ask each other questions from the audience. And yeah, that's Constitution in a nutshell. <laughs> so that's really a prime example uh -huh. of the arts reaching out to a community, the whole country, and trying to explain something as fundamental as what the Constitution means. Yes. Um, and Heidi does a wonderful job. Heidi, for your next play, I do want to recommend that you remind people that most of women's uh, suffrage and most of women's rights have not been a result of court rulings. Mm -hmm. um, court rulings fell way behind in promoting the rights of women. And it was really popular activism that changed the country's attitude towards women. So it's the, the arts, drama, everything gets involved. But most of us think about community outreach as things like politics, yes. the law. We don't think about um, smaller things or even bigger things, but in a different realm like the arts. Yeah. But You've been involved in community activities yes. most of your short life. <laughs> but tell us some of the things you do. Okay, so, well, the way it started is um, it was summer. I didn't have anything to do, and I guess my mom wanted to get me out of the house. <laughs> um, so she put me in a boatload of activities. So I had, like, every year I had a different summer camp. One, I have a biking summer camp. I had Girl Scouts of America. I did the summer camp in my school, and those were all great because they all involved like different acti activities. Because I did PAL, which is like a, a New York group. I don't know, they help kids in the summer and things like that. So she put me in all these activities. But the ones that really stuck with me were Girl Scouts. Um, violin, which which was I was horrible at, um, <laughs> hockey, debate, and drama. So those were the five ones. So drama in middle school, I did school plays. We did the we did the Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Annie. I was Annie. Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't know I could sing. Um, did Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. I played young Nala and. When I did violin, like the thing is that when you need violin, you you need to do like a lot. You need like a lot of patience because you're stringing things that you don't even know how to string. But I left that. <laughs> so I did something called hockey. It's I did hockey at um, Harlem Dowling after school. I think you guys know what hockey is. And so I, I said, I don't want to do hockey anymore. So my mom placed me. She said, well, you're going to do debate. So I joined debate, and I still had drama. So my debate coach, Mr. Beatty, was also the one of the drama teachers because he plays piano, and he sings, and he does almost everything. I love him. So, yeah. Those are the activities that I did. Yeah, drama and debate. Stuck I happen to believe mm -hmm. that debate is a wonderful way of building confidence in young people. Yeah. 
because it teaches you how to get up on your feet and talk about things that are important, because I don't know about your debate club, but mm -hmm. mine would pick really important uh, issues around the world. Yes. And they assign you a pro or a con yes. the issue, and you didn't have a choice of which side you were gonna promote or defend against. And so it really does teach confidence, yeah, I That's think. exactly what happened. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but it also does something. Mm -hmm. I think we don't learn in school often enough how to discuss things together, how to really go back and forth with an idea and try to defend it or try to promote it, whichever side you're on, and do it in a way where you're using reason. And it's a skill that we think we learn in school, but I don't think you really learn it until you do debate club. Yeah, that's true because when I joined debate in the second semester of sixth grade, I was just like a little girl, um, full of activity. I want to say something. I still am. Okay. I still am. Uh. <laughs> I still am. Well, I was a smaller child. <laughs> I think I was She's become very precise. <laughs> Heidi, you have something to do with that. I'm not sure, I think it's all Well, uh, so I joined debate, but yeah, when I was in debate, Mr. Brady, yeah, he instilled like a lot of confidence in everyone because when I first started, the original like group of kids that were in debate and we like kept doing it until we were in eighth grade, we developed. It's like we had our own character arc of progression. So I became a shy, timid, younger child and I became a debater that knows how to debate and I became really confident because it's the same thing that Justice said. Um, you were just assigned a topic, like two or three topics that you had to do for the month. You had like a you had like intensive studying of them. Um, then you would go do tournaments and scrimmages and then you would go, you'd prepare for like 20 minutes, you'll run to a column in some school's cafeteria and see what side did you get, who's your judge, who, what's gonna happen. So that's what happened. So it was a lot of running back and forth. But I, I agree with you, it did instill a lot of confidence because it does. sometimes when the debates were like, I don't know, sometimes when like there was a little error, you would have like a novel this seventh grader going against a, a ninth grader that's had years of experience way before you and you would get crushed. <laughs> but that builds a lot of confidence because sure, I'd be scared out of my mind, but I still learned how to do it and that's how I learned how to um, overcome um, fiercer opponents, so yeah. But I'm raised that because I do think mm -hmm. that we need more discourse mm -hmm. in the country, yes. that we need more talking to each other and talking in a reasoned way, and this is a forum that really does help that yes. a lot. So we're talking about big community things sometimes, and that I started earlier with mentioning that's most people's idea of outreach and community. But there are so many things people do besides those big things mm -hmm. that are so important. You talked about your Girl Scout leadership, yes. all right? When I was in college, I read in a local newspaper that a man had gotten uh, diverted from one of the New York airports to an airport in Newark, New Jersey. And he became very agitated when he was taken off the plane because this was in the 1970s. And there weren't that many Spanish speaking people in the airport working. And the police were called because of his agitation and they took him to Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. They had no one in his unit who spoke Spanish. Took him a week to convince the visitor of someone else to call his family and get him out. Oh. And the little thing I did was to organize the group of Hispanic students on campus to go visit those patients once a week. We didn't do it for long, it was a couple of hours each week, but at least they had someone who could speak both languages and communicate any difficulties they were having in, in the hospital, tell it to the nurses or to whomever, um, and even get messages to their family. And it was really a wonderful experience. But other people volunteer in homeless shelters and some people do it by, um, by going to their school and working with their schools. But it doesn't really matter how you make the world better, 
There are so many problems we have. And we as individuals can do so many big and small things. And if each one of us takes a step in doing one thing of value in our communities, just like the Kennedy Center is doing with this REACH Center, then we start making a difference. It's the cumulative work of all of us together. And you are proving to me that at 15, you can have that spirit. Oh, thank you're here. You. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> delighted you're here. So, if you had to think about what other artistic ventures you thought something from what the Constitution means to me mm -hmm. that producers and writers should be thinking about. What would you like to see more of in the arts? What do you mean? like Just that. What other subjects do you think they could take on and do? Like, what do you mean by subjects? Well, <laughs> we have To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. which is on Broadway right yes. now. And that was a picture of what the South was like mm -hmm. um, in a period of time. And one in which uh, we know that um, that horrible things sometimes happened yes. to people of color, okay? What the Constitution to me is now talking about the women's movement yes. and what the, how important the Constitution is. Um, you're Dominican by background. Yes. And we know that they're going to produce West Side Story soon. Mm -hmm. um, produce it again, I mean. But are there other things in those areas or like those that you think you might want them to start doing Let's see. in the arts? Let's see. I mean, all those things you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd like to see more of the minorities, you know, not just like three plays, like To Kill a Mockingbird and what the Constitution means to me. I feel like there should be a variety of Hispanic shows, um, the Hispanic shows that like represent the people that have not been represented for many years. And I feel like there should be, because a lot of the reasons why they're not out there is because there's things that we don't want to talk about. There's things of America's past that people just don't want to talk about about. So I think what you just said right there, just more representation of um, minorities, like in the community, it could be like anywhere. I just feel like Well, there's a talk about yes. that everywhere, uh -huh. which is how do we get more diversity of all kinds? Yes. And, and um, people hear me talk about our court all the time. And they think when I talk about diversity, I mean just gender uh -huh. and ethnic or, or um, color diversity. And I don't. I think that when we think about diversity, we have to think more broadly mm -hmm. about skill sets too. And among those things for justices is, we need justices with more background experience in some of the legal issues that really affect people's lives. We have no justice who's practiced in environmental law. We have no justice who's practiced in immigration law. We have no criminal defense experience on the bench. Um, an exception or two for some white collar appellate issues that they litigated. Um, <laughs> but no courtroom experience. Um, and I think it's probably true of the arts as well. Yeah. They get typecast into a certain view of what kind of experiences enhance productions, but you don't see a Hamilton. Mm -hmm. where they play a black man as a president of the United, a founding father of the United States or a Hispanic. Um, those are really, I think, creative outreaches to yeah. the community. And now they got the talent coming along. <laughs> so I think that's pretty neat, don't you? <laughs> Now, how did you get picked for the Constitution and me? Well. This is my curiosity. <laughs> well, 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 well. Uh, well, see, from what I remember, well, I don't really remember correctly, because, you know, the brain changes, and you don't really remember anything correctly. But uh, uh, besides that, um, I think I was in the learning lounge. And Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you guys were having an open call 
for young debaters. Yeah. And Mr. Beatty came to me and a few other debaters, I believe, and they're just like, well, I guess they're looking for somebody that has debate experience and somebody that has drama experience. I think that's what happened. So I was just like, okay. So I think I called, Maria called me or somebody's contact information called me. And this was like two years ago and I was like, 12 years old, so. They she just had a birthday four days ago. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, um, and then I went to an audition in Manhattan, and I, I think I had to remember an excerpt. Um, I went, all, Heidi wasn't there for my first audition. Um, <laughs> I spoke to the director, he talked, I had to talk about um, like my debate experience, I believe, I don't really remember correctly, or had to remember something, and then I think Oliver was taken away with what I said about debate, because <laughs> I was talking about a topic that we were doing right there, we were talking about something called ban the burqa, like should we ban the burqa, and I was just like, no, we should not, <laughs> because even though if it's not clearly stated in the Quran, um, if somebody wants to wear something, let them wear it. Would do you have proof to say against this? The 2% of crimes that were committed while somebody was wearing one? No, thank you, but I'm, I'm going on a tangent right now. Um, <laughs> you understand why debate's so good, don't you? <laughs> Um, and then I think I got a call back. I had to remember another excerpt, um, a metaphor that Heidi explains about some magic lake that she explains Mount St. Helens in the play. And I was just like, okay. So I remembered that. My mom pushed me so hard to remember that excerpt. I was just like, I got it, I got it. She was like, no, say it again, say it again, say it again, <laughs> say it again. I'm just like, oh my God, okay. Well, it paid off. And that was too Mothers are important yes. even when they're annoying. <laughs> Um, Heidi, how many performances did we do? Like 10? Yes, the first time we did it in a tiny 75 seat theater yes. in East Village for like 10 nights. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was two years ago, and then I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Um, I know what acting feels like now. <laughs> and then a year later, I, or a couple months later, I get an email saying, well, we're doing this show again. Um, New York Theater Workshop, and I was just like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, I, they got an email, they said, do you wanna do it again? They're just like, there's another debater here, her name is Thursday. Um, we did it there at New York Theater Workshop. I think we got extended a couple times, and then after New York Theater Workshop, we moved to somewhere in New York, uh, another theater in New York called Greenwich House. Um, we did performances there, we got extended, like two times, one time. Um, and then after in Greenwich House in like December, I think they're just like, well, we're going to Broadway. And I was just like, <laughs> we're going to Broadway. <laughs> and I, and then I just finished Broadway. I think we were there for about five, six months. I have a terrible memory. If you, if you guys don't notice. Can't no be memory. that bad. <laughs> <laughs> And, and now you're in D.C. Yeah. Was this your first time in D.C.? No. Um, no? Uh, my mom and her union, she has a union, because my mom works for the city, the government job, Human mm -hmm. Resource Administration. We <laughs> a couple times with their union for a couple of marches. I don't remember specifically what the marches would be like, but I know it was a whole bunch. I know there were just like guys petitioning. And some man came up to me and petitioned someone, come on, save the planet, plant some trees. And somebody else was saying, join the movement. So I was just like, I don't know what march this is. Is it a mixture? I'm not sure, but I'm in DC. But we only came for like a couple hours and now I'm actually in DC, you know, just like exploring this. I'm just like. Well, oh. I have people here who are going to enjoy sure that you get a tour of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Do all of you know you can come visit the Supreme Court? Yes. Um, maybe this audience does, but those who are listening, not everyone knows. We do get close to half a million visitors a year. Oh. Um, but so many people don't know that the building is open. And it's part of government, one of the three branches. And it would be nice if you lived in this city, or even if you're visiting, if you come visit. It's a beautiful building. So that includes you and your mom. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll get you there one way or another. <laughs> I mean, I hate to tell you this, but we went yesterday. <laughs> oh. Uh oh. I hate to My assistants are, are shaking their head yes. <laughs> I wasn't there till the late afternoon. <laughs> yeah. We want to come back though. Yes. 
yes, yeah. yes, uh, yes. You can always come back and see me. <laughs> Um, no, it is a beautiful. So what have you liked about DC the most? You the came weather. to the core. Oh, the weather is beautiful. The weather, because right now in New York, it's like 60 degrees, and over here it's like 70, and it's going to be 80 and 90. In New York, they're getting I'm going to tell chill. you, don't come back in August. <laughs> is, is it really hot over here? Mm, I think it competes with uh, Santo Domingo. <laughs> Well, then I uh, won't be coming in August. <laughs> but it is nice. I, I was thinking today, as I was thinking about our talk and how impressed I am with you, uh, I didn't get to see Roselli in the play because I got to see Thursday. Yes. And I don't know if that was by accident or not, but Thursday had been a part of a program yes. um, that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, the court runs. And it's called the Sonia and Selena uh, Internship Program. And they've received funding from a number of sources and they pay a small stipend to high school, college, and law school students to work in the courts. Hmm. And it ha so happened that before Thursday was cast yes. in the debater's role that she had been in the program and I had met her the summer before. So she mentions that, just how you tell your autobiography yes. in the play. She told hers and mentioned the program. And I was receiving weekly, if not daily, uh, notices from friends who had seen the play that the program was mentioned on the play. But it is very gratifying to me, and I hope that you reach stardom someday in a way where you will continue your community outreach. Because for me, programs like that, that inspire and help young people to further their education and to do, to dream about doing things that some of them only dream about. I guess when you were an Annie at school, I don't know if you dreamt about being a famous actress. I mean, I did. I just didn't okay. know it was going to happen so quickly. Uh. Well, I mean, I don't think I'm famous right now. So just to let you guys know. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, maybe not as famous as Lynn Miranda, <laughs> but there's few who have reached that level of fame, OK? Um, but you, you've, you've gotten on Broadway. So a lot of actors and actresses who spend their life practicing before they do that. Mm -hmm. And you've really done it very quickly in your life. But I hope you, with every young person in this room, stays inspired to try to make a difference, and especially a difference that will help people. That's what I was talking about earlier when I was talking to all of you about the small and the big steps. It really does change the world to have people doing everything, to have you concerned about something that's happening in your community and stepping out of your everyday life to help your community. Um, and I'm a very firm believer. I know the Kennedy Center draws so many volunteers who work in day in and day out as docents or as just assistants and volunteers in various aspects, aspects of the Kennedy Center's outreach. Uh, there's always someone who needs your help. And it doesn't really matter what you do as long as we reach out and touch people in some way. If we try to make a difference in what we're doing. And so I'm hoping for you that you don't stop doing all this stuff. Is there Mr. Beatty still in your life or is he, he's middle, was he? Uh, he still reaches out to me. Uh, <laughs> he still shows Roselli how's high school, how's the play, how's uh, the show. So he's still <laughs> teaching in middle school. And are you still judging debates occasionally? I want to, but mm -hmm. I've been doing this. Uh, <laughs> at some point you'll get back to it. Yes. Are they gonna take you to other cities? I mean, yeah, because the show said they were going on tour and I think in December I leave for LA for two months Ooh. and then Chicago and then I guess is your mom going with you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're only 15, so I don't yeah. think mom's going to let you travel by yourself. Mm -hmm. So what would you want to say to them about involvement, to about to the audience, about outreach and involvement? What is it, what message do you want to leave with them? 
like to say? <laughs> Hold on, let me think real quick. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just stay inspired. Um, stay helping people. Be a good person. It's free. Um, I know. I know. Sometimes um, you can get pretty mad or overcome with outrage. I know I do sometimes. But you got to learn how to center yourself. Control yourself. I don't know. Find some way to relax. I've been watching yoga with Adrian on YouTube. So. <laughs> So, and I watch Netflix, it's very therapeutic for me, so all you gotta do is just find the thing that helps you center yourself, helps you stay kind, you know, stay inspired, you know, well. So, I have a bit of a silly question. With all the ways that we're similar, and I've mentioned five or six of them, so why is it that when you were asked what you wanted to become, you said, that uh, when you were older, you mentioned professional acting, mm -hmm. writing a book, or becoming a doctor or therapist. Yes. What happened to someday becoming a Supreme Court Justice? <laughs> uh, uh, well, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I get asked that question every night, but with different years. So sometimes we'll say 10 years, five years, 20 years, 50 years. So I like to switch it up. You know, sometimes I'll be an actress. Someday I'm a CIA agent. Someday I'm, um, um, what are those? Uh, what, a soul cycle instructor. <laughs> sometimes I'm an actress. I don't know. Sometimes I write books. Sometimes, so, I don't know. But still, she hasn't said a Supreme Court oh. justice. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never really thought about it. I mean, this is a crazy question. But no, it's not 15 it is. You have, <laughs> you have all of college to decide what you want to do. And you really should use college to explore all the subjects you can. When I talk to people about college and its value to me, was very much that at least my first two years, I took courses in all the things that I wanted to learn more about. And so, uh, and not history, which is the major I took, mm -hmm. and I took the history class each semester just to make sure I was on the right track. But I took the topics that were talked about in the newspapers every day. I took an economics class because I heard people talking about supply and demand, and I wanted to know what that meant. I took a sociology, a psychology class, because I've heard people talk about Freudian theory, Pathloff reaction, words that were in books or in the common parlance, and I didn't understand what they meant, and so I took the psychology class, not because I wanted to be a psychologist. I took an art class, and um, because I had seen pictures in my grandmother's house and in my own house that I didn't understand, it took me until I went to college to find out that a picture that was in my mother's apartment for most of my life was the scene of uh, Marie Antoinette oh. telling people to go eat bread. <laughs> um, Go eat cake. <laughs> Go eat cake. I didn't know that until I got to college. But by going to that art class, I'm not an artist, I can't draw a thing. Oh no, there's one thing I can draw, a cat. <laughs> Some teacher saw how bad I was and showed me how to draw a cat with two circles. <laughs> I can do that, but I can't do anything else. But I can look at art and enjoy it. Um, I took a sculpture course because I wanted to see what it felt like to work with materials in my hand. And again, I'm totally not artistic, but I love the experience of doing that and listening to the artists talk to me about things. And I didn't do theater or the arts because I can't sing or dance. <laughs> I know, some people are gonna say, I've seen you dancing on YouTube. 
There's a secret to that. Um, when I was 50, I decided I would take on the two things that I didn't know how to do that I wanted to know how to do. The first was swimming. Um, I had really taken a YMCA, it wasn't a YWCA back then, it was a YMCA class for kids to teach them how to swim. And I don't know how I passed because I never figured out how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to swim. <laughs> ah, so it's never too late. At 50, I went and took an adult class. And I tell people that at the end of the class, I was the last one in the class to finish my 20 laps. <laughs> Slowest time, the, they all waited for me, and then I got the biggest cheer because I finished. <laughs> So I finished, okay? And the same thing with dancing. I'm pitch deaf, <laughs> so you can't really sing when you're pitch deaf. And I know that I can't do that. But I found out that I can follow. And Justice Alito once said, when I said this at a function where we were both speaking, that he wished he had known before that I was capable of following. <laughs> tell him what I tell people, which is I only follow people who know how to dance well. <laughs> but if the guy can keep a beat in the room, I can follow it. And that's what I do. And so um, it really, you started to talk about college, and I hope that you will use it to expand be beyond what you already know, to learn for the sake of learning new topics and new things that will interest you. And that might really give you that direction in life that you're doing well by not getting stuck in right now. And if it is acting professionally, I think we'd all be the better. But if not, I suspect you'll do whatever you're gonna do really well. So just do whatever you're passionate about. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, you can ask, you know, you've been letting me do a question asking. You're very wise, Justice. Oh, thank you. And I'm obsessed with college. Like, I'm actually obsessed. Like, I'll spend hours on college websites. Really? Hours. Okay, yeah. why? I don't know, I just like the, the way that it, like, the environment of it, like the fact that you're like taking classes, you're kind of an adult and kind of self-sufficient, but not really. And you're very wise too. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly why I tell most kids to go away from home, because you're independent, but not completely. And most colleges provide a little bit of a net to help pick you up if things go wrong. Not all of them, because some of them are really big. Others are tiny, like the one I went to, which is not so small, but it's pretty small. Which one did you go to? I, go, I went to Princeton. Oh. But unlike a lot of the other Ivy League schools, it's very small in comparison to them. And they have a, a much, much smaller graduate program. So at Princeton, most of the attention is on you as a student. But you have to figure out what kind of place you want to go to, big or small, medium. Um, what kind of environment do you want? Do you want city or do you want something that's more like a traditional college campus? Yes. Uh, I suspect. Yes. Okay. I want to get it, out of New York City. Uh, that's what I do. And I loved my four years in college and I got all of the skills I needed. And then I went to a city for law school. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't left the city since then except to come to Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is a small city by um, the, my standards, how's that? Um, but it is, it is still pretty much an urban center. Yeah. But um, what are you thinking about right now? What kind of college? Small, you want a college town. You want it out of New York City. Yes. Do you care where out of New York City? I mean, I mean, 
not really, as long as it has the right classes and the mm -hmm. right courses for, to, that fits what I'm looking for right now. I mean, honestly, I just don't want to go somewhere that's a city because I grew up in the city my whole life. So I want to go something that's probably rural, urban. I'm just like, it doesn't have to, it, does, it doesn't matter if it's big or small because I'll get lost anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but you really don't. You, I, I, a lot of kids talk to me when they get disappointed about not getting into the college, their first choice. And there's a whole lot of people who fall in that category, who don't get into their first choices. And the disappointment is often great for reasons that I think they will understand very quickly are not important. Virtually every college has a wide community of people. And what you have to do is find the people you get along with the most and find those individuals that will um, inspire and help support your passion, whatever that is. And you really just have to look for them because they'll exist. I mean, most college campuses are not tiny. They're somewhere in the middle of that. And there are always people who are similar to you and who like things you like, and who will give you the security then to reach out to people that are not similar to you and introduce yourselves to them and learn from them as well. I mean, one of the things that happens in the play you're in is that Heidi sees a world that's very different from the one that she came from. And she experiences, it's uh, American Legion clubs across the country, and they're very, very different. I used to sing karaoke. This is before being a Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> one in Virginia um, with friends who loved singing karaoke there. So I don't think that's what Heidi did, but that's what I did there. <laughs> you know? So what has been the most unusual experience you've had as an actress? What has struck you in sort of your head that stays there all the time? Something someone said to you, something... There's been a lot of unusual experiences, but mostly I think it's kind of people coming up to me and saying, hey, Rostelli, I show you in the play, or hey, Rostelli, you're gonna be late to debate call, or things like that, because I never thought that I'd be in a place where you have like everybody that has like eyes on me, or eyes on what I have to do, or just like, oh my God, I saw you in that, in that play the other day. You were amazing, you were so great. So honestly, that in general, just like people People coming up to me is like kind of weird to me because I never thought that would happen and I'm still and I still think that's weird because I'm just like oh okay hi new person that I've probably seen before but I don't remember your face so yeah, that whole experience is pretty weird to me <laughs> happens to me all the time <laughs> <laughs> The one thing that I will say about that, mm -hmm. um, if you find it in your heart to be able to love people and to really understand that those people individually themselves are important yeah. and that if you can take that moment with them just to make them a bit happier because you smiled at them and said thank you. It's really worth the experience. Now, the day in Costco that I got um, followed in every uh, aisle of Costco <laughs> and had to leave my groceries behind because I was scared, that's too much love. Okay? <laughs> That, that, that can be too much love, all right? And, uh, and actors and actresses speak about people who become stalkers and others who carry it a little bit too far, and that does happen too. Um, and you should be aware of that because you have to watch. Um, but I do think that for most people who come up to you, they are saying something from their heart. They enjoy something you did and, um, and just saying thank you is nice for them as well. So enjoy it, because wait till you perform in something that people don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi just went like this. <laughs> I told her actually, I said, this is her first play, and I was like, I promise you it's not always like this. <laughs> 
<laughs> I suspect. Um, there's plenty of decisions I render that people don't agree with. <laughs> And I tell most people, um, there will be more than one decision in my career that you're not gonna like. Because if I agree with you all of the time, there's something wrong with me. Because <laughs> the law is not written just for us. The law is written for all of us. And so when you are a member of a community as diverse as our United States, with all the different kinds of laws they have, and the different ways they affect people, you have to expect that justices are going to join or be a part of decisions you don't like because they will feel that the law doesn't permit an outcome that you may think is right. And I remind people, we're human beings. We get things wrong. Um, and sometimes we get things right under the law that are just not right for you or for your sense of what justice means. And that's an invitation for you to take action, isn't it? Yes. To go change the law or to go work on changing people's minds about the law. Um, but that's the part that I speak only through opinions. I can't speak on issues publicly like you can. You can take and say popular things, um, but I can only do it through decisions and hope that I inspire people to try to work on the changes that the community needs. And just make sure you get your mother to vote every November. <laughs> Kids your age always ask me, what can I do to be civically involved? And I tell them, you can get everybody in your family to vote. You wake up in the morning of a, of a voting day and you make sure that you ask them, have you gone out to vote? And you push them if they come home and tell you no, <laughs> kick them out the door, okay? <laughs> um, but if you ever get a chance, volunteer in a political campaign. It doesn't matter on what level, whether it's local. My, my first was a mayor for the city of New York. And what I met was incredibly passionate people who really believed in their candidate, who were spending hours on end every single day doing work for that candidate. And many of them were knocking on doors, others were handing out leaflets, some were simply answering phones at headquarters. People were doing all sorts of things, but just out of a passion for serving the country. And I think we forget that about public officials, especially the ones we disagree with, right? We, we often just assume that because we don't like their positions, that somehow it means that they don't have a passion to help. They do have a passion to help, just in a different way than you do. And so for me, if you ever have a chance to do that, do it for a period of time, just to experience it. It's very, very exciting to be with people who are that excited about what they're doing. Now, I didn't volunteer, I got put there by somebody. <laughs> um, now I was working somewhere that summer and the boss wanted to help this candidate and said, um, you're gonna work there instead of in the office for eight weeks. And that's what I did for eight weeks, but it was a wonderful, wonderful eight weeks. I did something like that. You see how I mentioned my mother's union earlier? Mm -hmm. um, we did that when we were, when, for, for Hillary Clinton, when she was running. Ah. So we were driving around in a car um, in Pennsylvania, and some very rural area in Pennsylvania, and we were knocking on people's doors telling them, have you voted yet? Should, you should vote for Clinton, Hillary Clinton. So we hand them flyers. Some people, a lot of people said, um, I don't vote. I said, well, you should. And so I gave them a flyer. And some people said, well, I'm voting for Trump. And I'm just like, well, just read the flyer. And, 
<laughs> it'll tell you more about the other candidates, and it'll just people say, oh, well, I don't vote, or I'm independent, or I don't believe in that. Well, just read the flyer. <laughs> so I'm just trying to, you know, just trying to spread the word, and maybe. Well, your mother's up. taught you much with her union work. Yes. yes. She, she really has. She has passion, obviously. And she's passed some of that on to you. I think she's done a fairly nice job. <laughs> Question for you now. Now go ahead. <clears throat> it only took her a little while to get comfortable. <laughs> Deborah told her. Deborah Rodman told her that she could ask me questions. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> what does the Constitution mean to you? Uh, <laughs> different levels. As a citizen. It protects my rights against government intrusion. We are a negative constitution, not a positive one. The positive constitutions are more, the more modern ones. South Africa has one. It was the South African constitution that Ruth Bader Ginsburg referred some Egyptian students to who were talking about should we look at the American constitution or should we look at any other to how to get ideas. So the South African Constitution has a variety of different bills of right, and those amendments all involve positive rights. Everyone in South Africa is entitled to an education. We don't have that in our Constitution. You're entitled to basic health care. We don't have that. We have mostly negative things. We have the freedom of speech, mm -hmm. but against government intrusion. So once you get employed, your employer can tell you you don't have freedom of speech. You can't talk on X, Y, Z topic. A lot of Americans don't understand that. Um, but at least with respect to the government, there are things that our Constitution protects us against abridging freedom of speech, freedom of religion, petitioning the government, unreasonable search and seizures. We're entitled to certain things, like we're entitled to um, representation in court in a criminal case, but not explicitly in the Constitution. It was a court decision that said that due process requires that for your safety. But Many of the things that we take for granted as constitutional rights have come from decisions of the court interpreting the Bill of Rights. But as an individual, that's what it means to me. It protects me against the excesses of the majority. Now, when it comes to me as a judge, mm -hmm. it creates a structure for our government. And that structure says we have three branches of government. It defines the powers that each branch has, and it defines responsibilities that each has to check the other. So the veto power, yeah. the Congress's veto power over a presidential action is one of those core protections. But there are other things like passing the budget that only Congress can do. Um, initiate the budget and figure out what it should be is first Congress. President can veto that, but it's still Congress's re responsibility to initiate it. So as a judge, that separation of powers, the protection of the powers and limits set by the Constitution is what I do. But fundamentally, it creates the structure under which we as Americans live with each other. See, because that's what laws do. That's what laws mean to me creating relationships one with the other. And we don't think about it often, but think about what you do when you step out across the street and stop at a red light. Why are you doing it? You would probably say, because my mommy told me I had to. <laughs> the rest of us, when you think about it, it's safer. 
But that's not what compels you, is it? It's the law that says you have to. And simple things like our relationship in the workplace, one to another, who you can marry. All of these are created by our legal institutions, how we interact with one another. And for me, being a lawyer was always about service to people, doing what was best for those people under the law with each other. And remember something, the law is not the perfect answer to every legal problem. Because the law solves things under the law, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it solved it fairly or justly. Mm -hmm. That's a big word people use when they talk about the court's justice, but it's always justice under law, which is different than justice under morality. And people don't really realize that. We have to hold ourselves as individuals with one another to a higher standard than that set by law. I tell people all the time, there's no rule against being rude. <laughs> there isn't. And, and so why do most people not do it? Because we understand that we value our relationships also outside the law. But the law is that framework. And for me, the Constitution is that greater framework on how we interact with each other as people in cities and counties, in states, and between and among the states, and between and among all of the people of the United States. And that's a pretty heady thing, that Constitution to me. Um, I think what Heidi was suggesting in her play, and she can always correct me, is that we're not perfect. We're not a perfect union. We're still working at it. And I think a lot of people forget that part of the lesson, which is we have to work at making this a more perfect union. Um, that requires what we started with earlier. It requires a lot of hard work. So, that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. ah. So, I think we've come to an end. Yeah. This was the most fun I've had in a long time. Oh, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming.